So I just want to welcome uh, all of our participants today. Uh, I'm Adrian Shanker. I'm Executive Director of Bradbury Sullivan LGBT Community Center. We provide arts, health, youth, and pride programs throughout Eastern Pennsylvania, and we're headquartered uh, right here in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Uh, the census is very important to LGBTQ people because uh, our community deserves to be counted. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but our organization has been working for the last six months to ensure that LGBTQ people are counted in Pennsylvania. Uh, and some of our other work includes making sure that our community votes. Uh, we're a nonpartisan organization, but making sure our community votes. And, uh, and we also advocate for queer health and queer lives every day. So we're really glad that you're all here with us. And we're very glad to welcome um, you know, three special guests. So um, I'll do some quick introductions and then we'll have a little bit of a conversation about the census and issues that are important to queer and trans people in Pennsylvania and beyond. And if any of you have questions uh, that, are, that are listening in, um, th on the bottom of the Zoom screen, you'll see a Q&A. And if you click that, you can type in your question. I'll ask your questions um, or um, you know, Malcolm or Giselle or Theo, if you see a question directed at you and you just wanna answer, that's, that's fine too. Um, but uh, you know, this will be fairly informal. We would love to have community questions, um, in, you know, including your favorite question for uh, you know, one, of our, one of our special guests as well. So um, first, uh, so glad to welcome our guests. So Giselle Fetterman is Pennsylvania's second lady. Um, although you know, one, could, one could certainly argue that, uh, that she is um, you know, one of our top icons in the LGBT community in Pennsylvania right now. Uh, I, last year, uh, Giselle and her husband, Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman came to Reading Pride when the mayor of Reading uh, decided at the last minute that a pride flag was too controversial to have uh, flying from their city hall. And, uh, you know, people were very grateful to have the lieutenant governor there, but people were really excited to have Giselle Fetterman. Uh, and, um, and Giselle, the moment when, when you put on the unicorn uh, headdress uh, and, and did the selfies with everyone was one of my favorite moments uh, in, in my entire career. So thanks for being here with us. And then uh, Representative Malcolm Kenyatta from Philadelphia. Malcolm, is a leader in the LGBT community and someone who has um, one of our only two LGBT elected officials at the state level in Pennsylvania, uh, the first LGBTQ person of color elected in Pennsylvania uh, to the state legislature and someone who's really a champion for our, for our movement. And um, of course, we're so excited to welcome Theo Germain from Netflix's The Politician and, uh, um, and all the way from Chicago, but on Zoom, that's like a lot easier to visit with us. Um, so we're really glad that, that you're all here. Uh, and I'll just start by throwing out, uh, you know, something quickly about, you know, about the census in general, which is that, you know, sometimes when we talk about things like the census, um, it sounds like it sounds wonky and a little bit geeky in some in some ways. It sounds like this giant data set that the government has that has all this information about us. But really, it, it means so much to to all of our lives, even though we don't always realize it every day. Uh, and so, you know, I just wanted to start with a simple question that can be to any of you just about, you know, uh, why is it important that we queer the census? Why do we want to make sure that uh, that LGBTQ people are counted. Why is that important? Right. <laughs> yes, yeah, second lady, I can't. I can't start before you, please. Right. Oh, please, please. Okay. <laughs> well, it's important that everyone is counted, and of course, this includes the community that we love so much, which is this community. Um, you know, what I say is that to me, you're priceless, but you're about twenty one hundred dollars a year per person per year for the next ten years, and that comes back in resources that comes back and the roads that we drive it really affects every single one of us even if we don't realize it because it affects the second we step out of our doors what services are available to us and that number if we don't get it right now we don't have another chance to get it right we're stuck with those funds for the next 10 years um, and that's a really big deal so this is our chance to make sure we get it right and also affects our representation you know it's our voice um, you know it it gives us collective power and it's really important. It doesn't matter your immigration status. It doesn't matter how you identify where you live, what you do for a living. If you live in Pennsylvania, we need to count you. Um, what are some of the programs that are funded through, through the census? I mean, you, you talked about the about $2,100 per person. Sure, yeah, that includes food access. That includes the roads we drive on, 
Head Start programming really touches everything and it affects every single one of us. Oh, I have someone who wants to crash my meeting. And I guess I suppose I'll let them say hello. Hey, I, I had to stop in and say hello. <laughs> hey, hey, my respects. <laughs> Uh, nice to see you, Governor Fetterman. Thanks for joining us for a second. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had to say hello. Uh, hello. <laughs> that, that's, that's, re that's really cool. And, and, and again, we're really lucky to have an LG and a second lady who um, are using their platform to, to talk about this. Because one of the things I will, I will tell you, um, Adrian, that I've, I've learned is, you know, we can all think about on this call moments that our community is actively targeted with you know hateful policies and we fight against those as we actively should but one of the things i found in government is that more often than not folks who exist on the margins are completely ignored as a part of the conversation so when i walk into a committee hearing with locked hair and you know being one of the youngest people there one of only two queer people the conversations that we're having are different because I'm in that room. And I think the same thing goes for this wonky data. When we're thinking about the types of programs that we need to fund and the types of supports that we need in our community, it's very easy to say, if you don't have a certain immigration status, if you are on the margins in any way, let's ignore you. Let's not fund the things that are needed to ensure you have a whole and a, and a full life. And that happens already. And if we miss this opportunity, um, as Second Lady Fetterman said, there's not another chance. There's not another census for a decade. And this has the capacity to lock in a lot of that systemic erasure that we so often see at the policy level. I think that too, I can say that I did not participate in the last census that happened 10 years ago and I didn't do so very stubbornly um, because I was like very recently out and I was like, screw the system. Like I don't wanna be counted because the system doesn't wanna count me. And there was a huge like, it wasn't just an attitude that I had. It was something that I, that was kind of put on me and inherited because, you know, we live in a country that has so many issues in regards to like equal rights and et cetera, et cetera, that we like to pretend are, you know, not issues. Um, and as someone who has been an entertainer, you know, for a long time, but also has really been interested in being politically active and being smart. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, pieces of the system that I have learned as I've gotten older that are important to participate in because they're not going to solve all of the problems. It's not going to solve all of our country's problems if we all participate in the census, but we have it. It exists. And if we use it, there is some type of gain we may be able to get in return. And also it's incredibly important for us to count ourselves if we're the LGBTQ community because we have to fight against that, you know, subscribing to like not being active and not being involved, you know, cause we already have a huge issue with people voting in the US. And I imagine that the census is probably, you know, from what I understand, probably has similar issues. I also know that there's been a lot of controversy with this census because people who maybe don't have citizenship are like, how do I participate in it? Because I don't want to get tracked down, you know, by anybody that I don't want to get tracked down by. And I think that that is a legitimate concern but what I understand is that that is not an issue in the census. There's just some like fear tactics that are being you know, used by certain politicians to make people make decisions or not make decisions. Um, so I, that's kind of my perspective as someone who was very much like, I don't wanna participate in any of these things because I don't think it's really gonna, really gonna solve anything. It might be a tool to helping solve something at some point, you know? And I think that participating in things like the census and voting can empower an individual to be like, I might just be one person, but there's a part that I have in trying to utilize these tools for good. And also it's important that I myself am counted. Um, that's my thought in regards to the census. Yeah, I wanted to thank Theo for sharing that because a lot of people feel that way. And that's, that will really impact a lot of people who maybe have feeling just as you. And, and ironically, what turns out is those that are least likely to complete their census are those that would benefit the most from it, from, mm -hmm. the from those resources. So 
it's it's you sharing that story that's really going to help folks change their perspective. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I mean, I, I can also say too that you know I, I am someone who is a who is a white citizen of the United States, so there are certain fears and things that I don't have to deal with, you know. And so I also feel like as someone who has those identities, it's all the more important that maybe I participate in a particular system because if I have access to it, it's something that I should use because, you know, that can hopefully inspire other people who are incredibly disenfranchised to feel safe enough, you know, or to be able to benefit from that counting in some sort of way, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. <laughs> Giselle, can you maybe follow up on what Theo talked about in terms of, uh, you know, immigrants uh, being able to participate in the census? Because I think it's really important to make sure that, you know, our community understands that the census is about everyone being counted. And, uh, and I know that you've talked about this in other census events in Pennsylvania. Absolutely. And as a formally undocumented person, I, I completely understand why that fear may be because there have been rumors, because the president himself has attempted to spread these kinds of things, but the census is private and it is anonymous. So you are giving your information, but it's, it's anonymous. It's not tracking you specifically, it's tracking that you exist here. Um, so it is safe from that. That information isn't shared with a third party. Um, so I understand that fear because I lived in that fear for a really long time, but um, there are immense penalties if anyone who is a census counter would even share any information. I mean, there's jail time. It's, it's very serious. So um, your information is anonymous. Uh, Malcolm, you represent a district in Pennsylvania that has, um, you know, a, a pretty high population of LGBT community members. Can you talk about what the census means for, uh, for neighborhoods with lots of LGBT people or for, you know, communities that, you know, that you represent when you go to Harrisburg? Yeah, I, I wanted to just touch very briefly, and I'll uh, answer that as well, Adrian. But just on on what on what Giselle said and Theo said um, about the apathy that exists in engaging in government, from voting to the census to a variety of other things, it's it's not by accident. It is an it is a tool. It is a strategy by folks who want to ensure that people who already don't feel a part of the system never engage because a part of what they recognize is that if folks in these communities raise their hand and are counted in the census, um, vote from home safely or get out to the polls and vote, if we are counted, then that strength that exists by us being bold, being who we are, living out loud, and recognizing that there's so many other people that share that experience, that gives us a lot of power. And for folks who don't want us to have power, they'll use every tool they can to try to minimize people's faith and trust in the system. And that apathy is a natural response to people feeling over and over again that they don't count and they're not seen. And that's the reality here in my district. Um, certainly for the queer folks who live in my district, um, you know, we have the Gloria Cazares house, which, you know, houses a lot of uh, formerly unhoused uh, queer young people. Um, and that's not nearly enough in terms of ensuring they have the supports that they need to have the basics, like somewhere to live, which is why what the second lady said is so critical that these numbers will decide how much of those dollars are allocated to ensuring the Gloria Cazares House isn't the only one and that we're able to have multiple places where young people can feel safe and, and housed and, and feel like they have a support network, um, which is unfortunate that so many of our young people don't feel that. So many of our folks in our immigrant community don't feel that safety. Um, and you know, my hope is that folks do recognize it is safe to fill out the census and it can lead to us addressing some of these systematic challenges. Uh, we have a question uh, in the, in the Q&A from one of Theo's fans. Uh, from... I saw it, I've been thinking about the answer. <laughs> Uh, how would James and the politician incorporate the importance of the census into one of Peyton's election campaigns? Oh gosh, um, James loves data. James loves data and James loves collecting information and like is very, very into 
following the statistics and like crunching numbers and everything about that kind of to the point where like he kind of loses perspective, which I think is what happens in season two. And I feel like he would really, really, really be interested in going full force about the census. Um, maybe only for like a weird personal selfish reason in regards to numbers, but I see it as him doing something that feels a little more safe than addressing climate change, which is something that he kind of struggles to do, I think because of his own issues. And so I could see him trying to push participation and participation in the census as something that is like super important for young people to do because it will help people get more invested in Peyton Hobart's campaign. Um, so it's like, I don't, I'm not really sure how like pure his motives would be. Um, but I think he'd be really into participating in talking about the census probably as much as possible and making it a talking point for a platform. Yeah. That's my answer. <laughs> he'd probably get into a, he'd probably get into a fight with his coworkers about it too. I feel like, um, yeah. Well, unfortunately, the census does get politicized in real life. I mean, this year we've seen oh, yeah. um, the president yeah. of the United States literally uh, change the census timeline in the middle of the census collection period and put out ridiculous statements about you know immigrants participating. Uh, put you know putting out statements that are really about scaring people from participating, but you know really changing the census timeline only had one goal, which was to prevent people from completing the census. Um, you know the census isn't supposed to be political, right? It's supposed to be it's supposed to be data collection. Uh, yes. Yeah. It, it's it's supposed to just be you know the the numbers are what the numbers are, right? But but unfortunately, there are sometimes politicians in real life or in TV shows that. That, that seek out these opportunities to politicize. And I think that, um, you know, uh, unfortunately it's just, uh, it, it's not what it should be. Um, you know, G Giselle, you spend, you spend a lot of time promoting the census around Pennsylvania. And I'm wondering, you know, uh, how you feel or if you have any response to the idea of the census being, you know, inherently non-political. That it's really like anyone of any political ideology should support this. Absolutely. I mean, this is the one thing, I mean, we have many things that we all have in common, but this is certainly one thing that serves every single resident, you know, um, if anything, everyone should be rushing to get their census done if they realize the impact, but a lot of people still don't, you know, they don't realize that it affects everything. It really, I mean, the roads we drive on or the bus, we, I mean, it affects everything. So I think, that's, that's a big part of it. And I think there is a lot of fear and it can s continue to be spread. But like Malcolm said, there is so much power in representation. There's so much power in being counted. So if we all are coming together saying, we are here, like we need services, we need support, you work for us, like we need you. Um, why wouldn't we want that? You know, it affects who represents us in office. We can see the representative because we're undercounted. So an undercount is something that will really hurt. It will hurt all of us. And it'll hurt marginalized communities the most, right? Like it'll hurt the people that need it the most. Um, well. uh, the, the census isn't, uh, the questions on the census aren't asked perfectly. In fact, some of them are, you know, harmful. Like the questions that deal with, uh, the deal with gender are not asked in a way that us within our LGBT community would want these questions to be asked. Um, and uh, at Bradbury Sullivan Center, we just want to remind our community members that um, you are free to identify your gender authentically when you complete the census. You're free to leave a question out if that one question, if there's no way that you can answer authentically, you're free to leave that question out. We still hope that you will uh, make them count you by querying the census and participating to the best of your abilities. And we hope for a day 10 years from now when um, the government will respect LGBTQ lives in a more authentic way and will ask questions appropriately. Um, Malcolm, as a, as a legislator that sometimes gets involved in some of those kinds of conversations, you know, I'm wondering if you have anything you'd like to add to that idea of it's not perfect, but we should still take part in it. You know, I don't, I don't think Senator Booker was the first person to say this, but he's the first person I heard say it. Um, and he said, if, America hasn't broken your heart. You don't love her enough. Um, this, this, this country has broken my heart many a time. Um, but that's a part of why we get engaged in the way that we do. 
because we love it so much that we're in, we're doing the constant work of making sure that so many of the things that were written in the Constitution, written in other um, other portions of our founding documents, many of them authored right here in Philadelphia, where I live. Um, we're constantly pushing to ensure that those documents and the ideals that are written throughout them, that they are made real in our lifetime. And a part of the way we do that is by showing up and taking back our power, taking back our power. We're told a story over and over and over again about how little power we have, about how little impact one action makes or individual actions can make. But I think when folks recognize that there are forces that are working hard to keep us in the margins, to keep us from these processes, and they aren't doing that because you're powerless. They're doing that because you're powerful and they recognize it. But if they can keep us from recognizing it, it puts us in a position where the status quo remains and when we're not able to make those documents actually mean something. Uh, Theo, you're really into resource sharing and I, I follow you on Instagram and I see all of your really wonderful posts about um, you know, privilege, economic privilege and white privilege and, and the idea that you know, people who have the ability to share resources should be thinking about how to do that. One of the things about the census is about like making sure that resources from the government are shared equitably. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, about you know, resource sharing is something that you believe in uh, and, and, you know, just how this all ties in together. Yeah, um, I, <laughs> I, I think about this every day because there's a lot of, there's a lot of like, philosophical and like ethical questions I ask myself about like what lessons did I learn from my conditioning when I was growing up and like I I grew up in a really really small red farm town in central Illinois um, and everybody voted Republican and because of the family situation that I, grew, that I grew up in there was a lot of like really really intense feelings about like bootstrappy capitalism and like pulling yourself up from your bootstraps and doing it all of yourself and rugged individualism and like, you know, the government, you know, isn't giving you what you want, but not in an equity way, in a way that's like actually kind of like, you know, what am I trying to say? White people really like, white people are really conditioned to think that we don't have things when we have, we have most things or we have everything, if that makes sense. Um, and as I got older, I just kind of was like, I think that it is fundamentally messed up that I inherited all of these lessons and I don't want them. It's like, I truly believe in resource, resource sharing. I truly believe in community. I want to, um, I want to, you know, believe in teamwork and resource and skill sharing and sharing and reparations uh, above, you know, above any sort of like, manifest destiny, rugged individualism, if that makes sense. And so part of my interest in research, resource sharing is like, we're all that we have, you know, I think that we need to just take care of each other better. And I think that we need to look into a lot of ways that we can be better at, act, you know, that we can learn how we can access more resources, um, mm -hmm. how we can share more. And we live in a system that is really, really, you know, broken in a lot of ways. And we're using a lot of tools and things that are that are not good enough. You know, it's like voting as an example is an awesome way to be seen, but you know, there are so many people who are still being suppressed from voting and there's so much voter illiteracy that it's like, I know that the system is broken, you know? And so it's navigating being community focused and trying to use the tools that have been presented to the best of our advantage to kind of try to make do and try to work towards not having to make do at some point in the future. I hope that makes sense. Like, like uh, as, as like an entire person, I think a lot about resource sharing and like, you know, what, what do I believe in the most? And, and I believe in, you know, people surviving and thriving and having resources the most, you know, over me having more than something than anybody else has. Um, that was kind of a longer winded answer and was a little more philosophical than just like resource sharing, but that's truly how I feel about everything. Uh, Giselle, we have a question for you uh, that came in from Kimberly. And the question is about um, 
you know, how Pennsylvania is doing with census participation at this point. We're almost at the end of the census timeline since President Trump changed the timeline. Um, so we only have like a week left now. Um, and uh, Kimberly asked like in the past an undercount has sometimes led to a loss in uh, a loss of a seat in Congress uh, or other types of losses for Pennsylvania uh, money or representation. So can you speak to kind of where we are and how people might take action in the next week? Yeah, we're still not there. I mean, some cities are at 50%. Um, the stronger ones I've seen, we're nearing 80. That's still not 100, right? Wow. Uh, you can quickly do your census. It takes less than five minutes. You can do it online. You can do it over the phone. You can do it tonight uh, when you finish watching this. And what I ask is that you know, call 10 of your friends. Send a text message. Send a mess message to your group. Call some family members. Offer to help someone do it. Um, that's how we're going to reach those numbers because 50% in many cities, it's not good enough and neither is 80%. We all want to get to 100. And like what, what does 50% mean in, in like in practice for, for, a, for a community, for a city, for, um, you know, for people who, um, who might just think, well, sometimes we have 50% voter turnout and, you know, but what does it mean in terms of the census when we we're talking about only half our people being counted? So you take that $2,100 and you times that by 10 for every person. So take half of our population, let's say half of the state, you multiply by that amount and that's what's gone. And we are not getting it back. <laughs> It'll be 10 years that we're going to be living in that deficit. Um, so it's, it is really important. It's the most important thing that you can do that will only take five minutes to do. And it doesn't cost anything to participate. So uh, uh, the website as well that people can go to to complete the census uh, is 2020census.gov. So super, super easy to remember, 2020census.gov. I like the idea, Giselle, that you had about, you know, texting it to your friends. Uh, like I, every election day, I check in. And again, we're a nonpartisan nonprofit. But every election day, I check in with my friends and I text them and say, hey, just making sure you voted today. Uh, do, you need, do you need a ride? Like, do you need anything I can do to help you make sure that you can vote? And, you know, I haven't done that with my friends with the census, but I'm going to do it tonight, right? So I'm going to text my friends and, and ask them. I, I think that's a great, you know, a, a great simple thing. We all have 10 to 20 people we can check in with and make sure they've completed the census. Yeah. And just to give an example of the impact, right? I know there's a lot of people watching and listening right now, but if it was just the four of us, if the four of us sat it out, that's $84,000 for the state of Pennsylvania, that just the four of us. So imagine what a classroom sitting out looks like. Imagine what a community sitting out looks like. That is a lot of money. And that's money that would have gone to help all of us, right, in our state. And these are where the resources are coming from. So when we, we fight and we argue and we wish things could be better, this is one small way that we can help make things better. Absolutely. Uh, and I'm it's, a it's, math major, so I did that math in my head. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Malcolm, on the representation side, because that's, you know, you, you, you've probably spent some time thinking about, you know, what does redistricting mean uh, after a census? And that's something that happens, you know, every time a census is completed, districts are redrawn. Um, we've talked a lot about resources from the census, but we haven't talked about representation. I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to the importance of that. Yeah, you know, and that really is a part of the, the, the cynical scheme by folks who've done everything to reduce trust and faith um, in the census, is that these numbers do help to determine um, what our congressional districts look, look like, what our, our state and local districts look like. Every 10 years, um, these maps are drawn that determine who, who your representatives are in Congress. And we've had an issue here in Pennsylvania over many years where we haven't had fair maps, where the Pennsylvania Supreme Court had to get involved and say, your maps are completely uncontiguous. They're not fair. These shapes don't make sense. Um, you know, some of the shapes I saw, um, you know, I'm like, did my three-year-old godson draw this? Because um, this is not contiguous. This does not make sense. And if we can, if, if folks who don't support fair representation um, and a government perspective in terms of elected office, 
if they can say that, you know, certain communities, if those communities get undercounted, then they will have less representation in Congress, less representation at the state level, less representation at the city level. And so it's this really, you know, cyclical, deadly impact if we don't fill this out. And so that's why, you know, as Theo said, you know, one vote doesn't solve all of our problems. Filling out the census doesn't solve all of our problems, but these things individually are part of a well-balanced civic diet, as I like to say, you know, voting every six months, because there's an election every six months, um, a primary or a general election. There's a census every 10 years, um, and there are local things happening in our community as well where we can get involved. But that quick math that the second lady just did um, it's very scary if we think about it, if folks don't, don't come out, because again, it's the communities who've already been hard hit um, that are gonna see an even deeper blow um, if the numbers stay where they are. And I think in my district, last I looked, um, the number was like 55%. Uh, and I, I do wanna mention just about how the census does count L some LGBTQ people. Again, the census is not perfect. And the questions that the census asks were absolutely politicized by President Trump and um, the people that he has hired to um, to run this government. Um, but uh, but the census does count some LGBTQ people in important ways. So one thing that it does do is it it does count same sex households. Uh, again, that's not perfect. It should be more inclusive than that. But it counts same sex households and it importantly ca counts uh, married. LGBT people. And this census will be the first one to track that in a way that will give us some real information about, uh, about married same-sex people, same-sex couples in this country. Where the census falls short is when it comes to uh, counting uh, trans and non-binary community members and counting um, single LGBT people of all gender identities. Um, and of course, uh, you know, um, the, this, I want to say this in a nonpartisan way, but uh, the census questions are designed by the government that's elected to design them. So um, when we stand up and we make them count us, uh, we also, you know, we also make it clear that we want uh, things to be different in the future. We have a couple questions in the chat. So the first question um, I think might be uh, for Giselle, but any of you could answer. It's from Aiden. Um, what does the census impact that we don't normally see? And uh, Giselle, I think you might know uh, Aiden, so. Um. Hi, Aiden. If you don't know Aiden, you all need to get to know Aiden, because Aiden is going to rule the world very soon. Um, and, you know, Aiden, what you said is, you know, I have trans friends who have said, I'm not filling it out, because it, they're not asking me the right questions, right? And then it's painful, and um, it's not perfect, that's for sure. But that's why we need to vote also, because we need to have a president in place who will respect every community, who will have the right wording, the right identification. So it's not perfect. And, and it breaks my heart that, you know, well, how Malcolm said that his heart has been broken so many times. And it breaks my heart. And it shouldn't be that way. But it is going to be that way until we can change it. And that's why this is, these are all the things we can do to do that. Um, so Aiden, thank you for your question. Think about um, food programs, SNAP, Medicaid, Medicare. I mean, it's all impacted by the census. The funds that are going into these programs that are keeping communities going, keeping families going, um, it's all impacted by the census. Uh, Adrian, can I also just build on that to say, you know, my, my, my fiance, he's a researcher. Um, you know, that's what his PhD is in. And so often, folks who are doing research, um, you know, in service to our community or research on things that touch our community, like housing or whatever, they're often looking to census track data to try to um, understand what's happening, happening in our communities to provide policymakers like me with the best information on how to address some of these issues. And so there are a lot of folks, particularly like you know, queer researchers like 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 my fiance, who were also, you know, really terrified on when I look to the census, um, am I going to be able to get the best accurate, the most accurate information to, you know, encourage policymakers and other academics um, to have holistic 
conversations about our communities. Absolutely. I mean, this is the largest demographic data set in the United States, right? So it's used for all kinds of research. Um, and it's used by, it, it, in addition to the federal government, it's used by the state government too to make decisions because it's such a large data set. So, you know, state government agencies will pull census data to make decisions about where to put funds, where to put resources. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's data that's used everywhere. We have another question in the chat from Claudia. Uh, how can we avoid um, or combat suppression uh, besides encouraging our peers to participate? I guess like how can we how can we combat the census suppression that's that's in place in addition to simply telling people go take the census? Is there anything else we can do? Something that has helped me personally <laughs> has just been learning more about the history of suppression that we have in the country, um, specifically in regards to, uh, there's a really, really great book that I read recently by a professor named Carol Anderson. The book is just called White Rage. And it's just one of many books that goes into the history of like, making sure certain policies weren't passed in the government, you know, so that, you know, black kids, you know, then, therefore wouldn't have ex access to the school that they deserved. And like understanding more about the history of suppression and the history of resistance has personally just been inspiring in regards to like, stuff has been messed up for a long time and people have been resisting that and persevering and pushing through and being incredibly strong, you know, for a long time. And if they're able to do that, you know, that is the type of person that I want to model myself after. And, you know, I would want to encourage other people to uh, feel inspired to educate themselves about just kind of what's really been going on in the country for a long time. Um, I don't know if that would work. I can be kind of nerdy and, and I'm the type of person who will sometimes try to use a book to get somebody to get interested in an issue. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that, that's my answer so far as just trying to figure out how to inspire people to educate themselves about how, you know, the reason why they feel combative about voting or participating in the census is like, I feel like kind of what some policymakers wanted to do in order to control the money. Um, and I'm talking about historically, like over, you know, over like the foundation of the country, you know, I, I hope that that makes sense. It, it, it's the history has been helping me out a lot. I, I think it definitely makes sense. I mean, as someone who personally identifies as a socialist, um, I'm always surprised when other people who share that same kind of political ideology uh, don't think about the census as the way to ensure an equal playing field for, for all of us. That, you know, that, that this is the way that we make sure that resources go to the people who need the resources the most um, is by making sure that we're all counted. If, you know, if we, if we don't start by counting us, it's really hard to allocate resources. And the census, in addition to just doing, an, you know, a basic count, also, you know, measures where, uh, where people of different incomes live. So it allows resources to be shared with low-income communities more. It, it allows resources to be directed where they're needed the most. And we know that queer and trans people experience uh, you know, live in poverty in much higher rates and experience many economic challenges at much higher rates. Um, and uh, and this, is, this is one of the ways that we, that we fix that. This is one of the ways that we make sure that resources get to the queer and trans people who need our help the most is by making sure that uh, our government has to count us. And so instead of saying like, we want, them, we want to be counted, like I've been saying like, we're gonna make them count us. Like we're gonna log in on 2020census.gov and say like, screw this, they are now counting us. They, they, are, they are counting our people. And, um, and when we do that, like it's radical. Like it's saying that, you know, um, the Trump administration can keep on trying to suppress the census and we're not gonna let them because we're gonna, we're gonna participate anyway. <laughs> um, and uh, so that's at least my, my take on Right, but Adrian, I really can I just say quickly, you know, I think that there's like a twofold, you know, approach that I take to this when I'm often more often talking about voting, that one, like, I think we have to acknowledge the fact that like apathy is a normal response and a natural response 
to feeling like you've been like effed over multiple times. To want to disengage from something that you feel like is causing you harm um, is a natural, normal response. But I think we also have to be really blunt and honest with people to also say, you know, I hear people say, I don't do politics. Well, politics does you, <laughs> you know? And so whether you engage or not, decisions are made about your life, about your body, about your ability to live. Um, you know, Pennsylvania's motto is um, pursue your happiness, your ability to pursue that happiness. Those decisions are going to be made. And so the question is, are we gonna be a part of making those decisions or are we gonna allow that apathy, which is an intentional strategy by people who don't support our right to pursue our happiness, are we gonna allow them to win? Uh, Thea, I'm wondering what James would say to politics does you. Uh, the, the, the idea of, um, you know, politics happens to all of us. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> I'm smiling because I, I think that that is a phrase, I think that's a phrase that James would probably really like because it's kind of aggressive. Um, and participating in politics is, is just kind of his lifeblood. I don't, I mean, he... It's kind of like the main thing that he does. Oh God, I don't, I don't really have a smart answer for that, but I just think that he would like it a lot. And it might be something that he would want to say a lot after he learns about the phrase, like maybe in high school, you know, uh, you know, some AP history teacher said that phrase to him and he was like, yes, I like that. It's my mm -hmm. motto. Um, I think that's my, <laughs> I think that's my answer. <laughs> um. Uh, Malcolm, if, if if that phrase ends up showing on a future showing up on a future episode, you'll you'll I know. I will cry. I will call you Adrian. We'll credit. Cry. No, no, we'll send you a residual, and you're gonna credit. You're gonna write. <laughs> you don't. You don't have to send me anything. And I, I think you were recording when I'm like being a, a total nerd fan, and I'm like I watched it, but I love it so much. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you. We have another qu uh, question um, from Kimberly asking, um, in what ways. Does accurate census data, what ways is accurate census data especially important now during a public health crisis like COVID-19? Oh my gosh. Here, Adrian, why is it essential? Why is accurate census data important, especially right now during COVID-19? Yeah, so always, but um, you know, we don't know how long this is gonna last and how long this is gonna go for, but we do know that whatever we answer this year, it means we're locked in for the next 10 years. We know how difficult this year has been on everyone, um, how difficult it has been, especially on families who were already struggling. Um, and how much longer does that go? But whatever we do this year, we have no choice of changing it. We can't say next year, hey, we're really struggling. We need more funds. You know, we have more people here. We didn't count them. We don't have an opportunity to say that. So. Um, it's not a rainy day fund, right? It's something that we have that is to sustain how many people live here. And if we're not counting every single person, then that fund, those funds that could have gone to everyone is being split amongst everyone. And it, it really hurts everyone. And can I make a quick nerdy point to say that, you know, let's hope that there is a, a vaccine. Um, and, you know, my, my thought is that when they're thinking about the vaccine is distributed equitably, um, that they're also going to look at those, uh, you know, those pieces of data to say like, you know, 5,000 people live here. So we need 5,000, you know, doses of the vaccine in this area. Um, and if those numbers aren't accurate, it's gonna make it that much more difficult to ensure um, that that gets to the communities um, that need it most and that are most high risk. And one of the things that we know is that LGBTQ folks have a lot of comorbidities that make us um, higher risk um, when it comes to um, COVID-19, as well as folks in our immigrant community and folks who are, who are black or who are poor um, are dying from this at sky high rates. And so when we get a vaccine, fingers crossed, we want it to get where it needs to get quickly um, and in the amounts that, that we need. Yeah, COVID-19 has certainly unmasked the existing disparities that have caused so much harm to uh, marginalized communities, including queer and trans communities and communities of color for so long. And I really, I actually, Malcolm, hadn't thought about the vaccine measurements being based on census data I think you're right, like that, that would theoretically be like 
a fair way for the federal government to decide where to where to put those resources as well. And it's just another reason why, you know, we know that like cities complete the census at lower rates than rural communities and also cities experience COVID at higher rates than rural communities. So it's, it's really important that uh, folks who live in places like, you know, Allentown or Scranton or Philadelphia or Pittsburgh or any other, you know, any other more urban community in Pennsylvania, in addition to our rural communities, but our urban communities especially really think about completing the census just even if it's only for that reason. Um, so we're, we're nearing the end of the census town hall, but I wanted to, you know, go around and just ask if there's, you know, some final things that you'd like to really impart uh, from each of you about the importance of LGBTQ people standing up and being counted. Um, Can I just say two, two of the most important words to each of you? Thank you. Um, because seriously, um, you know, Giselle, and I, I know we're friends outside of this, but for you to use the platform that, you know, that you've built, um, you know, and as our second lady to spend the time doing this, um, it is incredibly impactful. Um, and as you said, we don't have another shot at getting it right. And you're spending so much time trying to help us get it right. And Theo, you as well, you know, have an amazing, you know, career, and you're using your platform to like spend an hour with us talking about the, the census. And I just want to say there's so many people who may have not tuned into this, who tuned in because they, like me, love the show, um, who now um, are able to, you know, be that much more seen um, by systems that so often don't see us. And, and Adrian, thank you for not just doing this, but you do this all the time with the center, with everything, I'm just lifting up our communities. And so I'm happy to spend some time with each and every one of you and to say to all the folks, you know, watching, you are so much more powerful than you know. And when you find out, oh my gosh, the way you're gonna change the world. Uh, when we planned this, we didn't know that we were going to have one of the keynote speakers of the Democratic Convention this year joining us on our Queer the Census Town Hall. Uh, and Malcolm, the, the moment where um, you and your fiance were in front of the, the television together, uh, I don't know that I've ever cried during a, pre a, presidential, a Democratic Convention before, um, but seeing, seeing you and your fiance there was very touching. Um, you know, I think that, that the reality is that uh, Queer and trans people are used to being left behind by our government. Uh, we have a storied history of being left behind by Democratic and Republican government uh, officials, right? Uh, people, of, people of both parties have said that we're not, as a population, that, that we are less than, we're not important enough. We're not their priority. It's not our time yet. Um, it's, we're too political. Uh, we're, we're too controversial. Um, our lives aren't, aren't, aren't next on their list, or it's not convenient for them to prioritize what's important to us. And, you know, at Bradbury Sullivan Center, we like to remind our community that, um, you know, we're, our organization is about celebrating our community for all of our, all, all of what makes us queer, all of what makes us who we are, um, regardless of how popular or how controversial it might be. Um, and so I, I really, uh, Giselle, I really appreciate the shirt that you're wearing today for this event. You know, I don't know that it would be every, um, you know, every second lady in Pennsylvania who would be willing to, uh, you know, sh like really show some representation. I, and during, you know, during a week that is celebrating uh, by visibility is, is, you know, it's even more important that uh, the shirt you're wearing is so public and, and, and visible for everyone to see that, that we have a, a governor and lieutenant governor in place that really do believe in the inherent dignity of LGBTQ people. So I, you know, um, uh, Theo, I'm a huge fan of, of the politician, but I'm a, bigger, I'm a bigger fan of the politics that you speak about on your Instagram uh, and um, really appreciate you being here. I do want to give uh, all of you just um, any closing remarks that you'd like to share uh, before we wrap this up. Um, I have a thought. Just earlier in, the, in our town hall, somebody brought up representation, um, which is also something that I think a lot about because of the experiences that I have with what that means as someone in the entertainment world. And I feel like this is something that can carry over into politics, which is that I think that because of all the issues we have, we are convinced by 
something that representation is the most important thing and is, and is all that there is. And I think that we put a lot of faith on representation and we put a lot of faith into like, hey, finally there's somebody who looks like me in Congress or finally there's somebody who looks like me on television. Like, I think that's enough. And we really fall short when we do that. And it's not just that we need, you know, the right kinds of people in Congress and we need more diversity on our TV screens when we're enjoying leisure time. And, you know, not just that we need to participate in the census so that, you know, we're represented, but like that is the tip of the iceberg. You know, being seen is, you know, sometimes an earlier thing in like a mission to like actually create more equity. Does that make sense? Um, I think that people are very quick to put to put faith into just seeing someone like themselves and being like, that's enough, we're done. And we just, you know, have so many problems that that's the beginning. And so we've arrived at the beginning. I think that's what I feel, I feel like, um, is that we're getting to this beginning point where it's like we're regularly seeing, you know, a, a visual change uh, when we look out into life. Um, but that's, but we have a lot more work to do. That's my thought. Of, of all of you. Um, Malcolm knows how much I love him because I get to tell him all the time, but today I get to tell you guys too. Um, and, you know, I like a lot what Adrian touched on. It's like the, uh, the rebellion and needing to be counted, right? It's like we must demand. Of all the things we must demand, being counted is part of that list. We must demand to be counted. Um, and uh, it's been a pleasure to spend an evening with you. And Malcolm, I cried as well. Like that was the only speaker I was waiting for was him. And it was beautiful. And I Instagrammed him stories all day. And I'm just so proud to have you. And, and this has just been a really special night. So just to close, um, uh, oh, Malcolm, I'm sorry. Uh, did you have any final thoughts? No, 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 that, that, that was it. It's, it really has been well said. And I'm just so glad to spend a night with you. And I'm going to be talking to Matt about it. <laughs> it's upstairs um, with it. Well, just to wrap up, I just want to remind everyone, 2020census.gov. And the final day this year, again, it was supposed to be a month later, but uh, we can, we can uh, both resist this president and participate in the census at the same time by doing it by September 30th at 2020census.gov. We also wanna remind our community to, to register to vote uh, and uh, to make sure that you're registered to vote and to sign up to vote by mail. These are all ways that we can stand up and be counted. And if you have questions about participating in the census or you need to talk to one of our employees at Bradbury Sullivan Center, uh, if you have questions about it, go to bradburysullivancenter.org slash census. And we have lots of information, including videos from some of our, uh, you know, uh, drag superstars from RuPaul's Drag Race uh, that'll help to, to, to convince you even more if tonight's event wasn't enough. We hope that uh, you'll all participate. And I liked uh, Giselle's idea of texting 10 to 20 of your friends tonight and reminding them. So thank you all for joining us. And uh, please join us in queering the census. Thanks.